Introduction to Sociology, 3rd Edition, an OpenStax textbook. This free audiobook is a public service of Los Angeles Harbor College. Register for in-person and online courses today by visiting www.lahc.edu. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 14. Relationships, Marriage, and Family Introduction Elena and Cam met through friends when they were in their early 20s. Elena had been out of college for two years and worked in the city procurement office. She took graduate classes in operations management, but she'd need a few more years to finish her master's. Cam had received extensive computing training while in the Navy and was a database architect at an insurance company. In their first few years of dating, the idea of marriage came up mostly through other people. Friends' weddings seemed like monthly events, and who's next? Small talk was unavoidable. Elena's grandmother and aunts added to the chorus. They talked about their home country, where women were married with a couple of children by the time they reached Elena's age. Elena often pointed out that they were wrong and the average age of marriage had been climbing for decades. These pressures were pretty minor at first. They came in the form of jokes, wedding dress texts, and the occasional insult about Cam's salary. But every once in a while, someone would sit Elena down for a serious talk or corner Cam while he was at a family gathering. Most of Elena's family predicted that things would change when she earned her graduate degree and could focus on her family. Things did change. Elena became compliance officer for the Office of City Services, resulting in almost a 10% increase in her salary. Cam became a supervisor three months later. They moved out of their apartment, which was in Cam's mother's garage, and into their own place downtown. They were happy. They were committed to each other. They didn't get married. Five years later, Elena and Cam were still living downtown, but they traded their rental for a condo. Aside from work, they co-founded a non-profit where Elena taught financial literacy and Cam ran computing boot camps for recent immigrants and refugees. Maybe it was the hundreds of children they met through the organization. Or maybe it was seeing their friends' kids. Or maybe it was being in her 30s. But Elena realized she wanted to be a mother. They started the adoption process and 18 months later welcomed a young girl who had been born in another country. When did Elena and Cam become a family? Was it when they moved in together? When they adopted the child? Does their not being married matter? Fourteen point one. What is marriage? What is a family? Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you should be able to describe society's current understanding of family, recognize changes in marriage and family patterns, differentiate between lines of descent and residence. Marriage and family are key structures in many societies. Many of us learn from a young age that finding and joining the right person is a key to happiness and security. We're told that children need two parents. Many of the tax laws, medical laws, retirement benefit laws, and banking and loan processes seem to favor or assume marriage. Should those assumptions be changed? Is marriage still the foundation of the family and our society? In 1960, 66% of households in America were headed by a married couple. That meant that most children grew up in such households, as did their friends and extended families. Marriage could certainly be seen as the foundation of the culture. By 2010, that number of households headed by married couples had dropped to 45%. The approximately 20% drop is more than just a statistic. It has significant practical effects. It means that nearly every child in most parts of America is either in or is close to a family that is not headed by a married couple. 
It means that teachers and counselors, and even people who meet children in a restaurant, can't assume they live with two married parents. Some view this decline as a problem with outcomes related to values, crime, financial strength, and mental health. Sociologists may study that viewpoint to determine if it is actually true. What is marriage? Not even sociologists are able to agree on a single meaning. For our purposes, we'll define marriage as a legally recognized social contract between two people, traditionally based on a sexual relationship and implying a permanence of the union. In practicing cultural relativism, we should also consider variations, such as whether a legal union is required, whether more than two people can be involved, or whether the marriage is a religious one or a civil one. Sociologists are interested in the relationship between the institution of marriage and the institution of family, because historically, marriages are what create a family, and families are the most basic social unit upon which society is built. Both marriage and family create status roles that are sanctioned by society. The question of what constitutes a family may be an even more difficult one to answer. It's a prime area of debate in family sociology, as well as in politics and religion. Social conservatives tend to define the family in terms of structure, with each family member filling a certain role, like father, mother, or child. Sociologists, on the other hand, tend to define family more in terms of the manner in which members relate to one another than on a strict configuration of status roles. Here, we'll define family as a socially recognized group, usually joined by blood, marriage, cohabitation, or adoption, that forms an emotional connection and serves as an economic unit of society. Sociologists identify different types of families based on how one enters into them. A family of orientation refers to the family into which a person is born. A family of procreation describes one that is formed through marriage. These distinctions have cultural significance related to issues of lineage. Drawing on two sociological paradigms, the sociological understanding of what constitutes a family can be explained by symbolic interactionism as well as functionalism. These two theories indicate that families are groups in which participants view themselves as family members and act accordingly. In other words, families are groups in which people come together to form a strong primary group connection and maintain emotional ties to one another over a long period of time. Such families may include groups of close friends or teammates. In addition, the functionalist perspective views families as groups that perform vital roles for society, both internally, for the family itself, and externally, for society as a whole. Families provide for one another's physical, emotional, and social well-being. Parents care for and socialize children. Later in life, adult children often care for elderly parents. While interactionism helps us understand the subjective experience of belonging to a family, functionalism illuminates the many purposes of families and their roles in the maintenance of a balanced society. We will go into more detail about how these theories apply to family in the following pages. Challenges Families Face People in the United States as a whole are somewhat divided when it comes to determining what does and what does not constitute a family. In a 2010 survey conducted by professors at the University of Indiana, nearly all participants, 99.8%, agreed that a husband, wife, and children constitute a family. 92% stated that a husband and a wife without children still constitute a family. The numbers drop for less traditional structures, Unmarried couples with children, 83%, unmarried couples without children, 39.6%, gay male couples with children, 64%, and gay male couples without children, 33%. This survey revealed that children tend to be the key indicator in establishing family status. The percentage of individuals who agreed that unmarried couples and gay couples constitute a family 
nearly doubled when children were added. The study also revealed that 60% of U.S. respondents agreed that if you consider yourself a family, you are a family, a concept that reinforces an interactionist perspective. The government, however, is not so flexible in its definition of family. The U.S. Census Bureau defines a family as a group of two people or more, one of whom is the householder, related by birth, marriage, or adoption, and residing together. While this structured definition can be used as a means to consistently track family-related patterns over several years, it excludes individuals such as cohabitating unmarried couples. Legality aside, sociologists would argue that the general concept of family is more diverse and less structured than in years past. Society has given more leeway to the design of a family, making room for what works for its members. Family is indeed a subjective concept, but it is a fairly objective fact that family, whatever one's concept of it may be, is very important to people in the United States. In a 2010 survey by Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C., 76% of adults surveyed stated that family is the most important element of their life. Just 1% said it was not important. It is also very important to society. President Ronald Reagan notably stated, The family has always been the cornerstone of American society. Our families nurture, preserve, and pass on to each succeeding generation the values we share and cherish, values that are the foundation of our freedoms. While the design of the family may have changed in recent years, the fundamentals of emotional closeness and support are still present. Most responders to the Pew survey stated that their family today is at least as close, 45%, or closer, 40%, than the family with which they grew up. As you may have seen in the chapter on aging and the elderly, different generations have varying living situations and views on aging. The same goes for living situations with family. The Pew Research Center analyzed living situation of 40-year-olds from different generations. At that age, millennials indicated that 45% of them were not living in a family of their own. In contrast, when Gen Xers and baby boomers were about 40 years old, around 2003 and 1987 respectively, an average of 33% of them lived outside of a family. The dynamic of nearly a 50 50 split between family and non-family for millennials is very different from a two-thirds slash one-third split of boomers and Gen X. The data also show that women are having children later in life and that men are much less likely to live in a household with their own children. In 2019, 32% of millennial men were living in a household with their children, compared to 41% of Gen X men in 2003 and 44% of boomer men in 1987. Again, the significant drop-off in parenting roles likely has an impact on attitudes toward family. Alongside the debate surrounding what constitutes a family is the question of what people in the United States believe constitutes a marriage. Many religious and social conservatives believe that marriage can only exist between a man and a woman, citing religious scripture and the basics of human reproduction as support. Social liberals and progressives, on the other hand, believe that marriage can exist between two consenting adults, be they a man and a woman or a woman and a woman, and that it would be discriminatory to deny such a couple the civil, social, and economic benefits of marriage. Marriage Patterns With single parenting and cohabitation, when a couple shares a residence, but not a marriage, becoming more acceptable in recent years, people may be less motivated to get married. In a recent survey, 39% of respondents answered yes when asked whether marriage is becoming obsolete. The institution of marriage is likely to continue, but some previous patterns of marriage will become outdated as new patterns emerge. In this context, cohabitation contributes to the phenomenon of people getting married for the first time at a later age than was typical in earlier generations. Furthermore, 
marriage will continue to be delayed as more people place education and career ahead of settling down. One partner or many, people in the United States typically equate marriage with monogamy when someone is married to only one person at a time. In many countries and cultures around the world, however, having one spouse is not the only form of accepted marriage, even if it is the most common. Polygamy, or being married to more than one person at a time, is accepted to varying degrees around the world, with most polygamous societies existing in Northern Africa and East Asia. Instances of polygamy are almost exclusively in the form of a man being married to more than one woman at the same time, rather than a woman being married to more than one man. While the majority of societies accept polygamy, the majority of people do not practice it. Even in the regions where it is most common, only an average of 11% of the population lives in arrangements that include more than one spouse. In these relationships, the husbands are often older, wealthy, high-status men. The average plural marriage involves no more than three wives. Negev Bedouin Men in Israel, for example, typically have two wives, although it is acceptable to have up to four. As urbanization increases in these cultures, polygamy is likely to decrease as a result of greater access to mass media, technology, and education. In the United States, polygamy is illegal. A recent Gallup poll showed that 21% of people believe polygamy is morally acceptable which is a major increase since earlier versions of the same poll. But the poll also found that polygamy was among the least acceptable behaviors considered in the study. For example, polygamy was far less acceptable than consensual sex between teenagers, though it was more acceptable than a married person having an affair. The act of entering into marriage while still married to another person is referred to as bigamy and is considered a felony in most states residency and lines of descent. When considering one's lineage, most people in the United States look to both their father's and mother's sides. Both paternal and maternal ancestors are considered part of one's family. This pattern of tracing kinship is called bilateral descent. Note that kinship, or one's traceable ancestry, can be based on blood or marriage or adoption. 60% of societies, mostly modernized nations, follow a bilateral descent pattern. Unilateral descent, the tracing of kinship through one parent only, is practiced in the other 40% of the world's societies, with high concentration in pastoral cultures. There are three types of unilateral descent. Patrilineal, which follows the father's line only. Matrilineal, which follows the mother's side only and ambilineal, which follows either the father's only or the mother's side only, depending on the situation. In patrilineal societies, such as those in rural China and India, only males carry on the family surname. This gives males the prestige of permanent family membership, while females are seen as only temporary members. U.S. society assumes some aspects of patrilineal decent, for instance, most children assume their father's last name, even if the mother retains her birth name. In matrilineal societies, inheritance and family ties are traced to women. Matrilineal descent is common in Native American societies, notably the Crow and Cherokee tribes. In these societies, children are seen as belonging to the women, and therefore, one's kinship is traced to one's mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and so on. In ambilineal societies, which are most common in Southeast Asian countries, parents may choose to associate their children with the kinship of either the mother or the father. This choice may be based on the desire to follow stronger or more prestigious kinship lines or on cultural customs such as men following their father's side and women following their mother's side. Tracing one's line of descent to one parent rather than the other can be relevant to the issue of residence. In many cultures, newly married couples move in with, or near to, family members. In a patrilocal resident system, 
it is customary for the wife to live with, or near, her husband's blood relatives, or family of orientation. Patrilocal systems can be traced back thousands of years. In a DNA analysis of 4,600-year-old bones found in Germany, scientists found indicators of patrilocal living arrangements. Patrilocal residence is thought to be disadvantageous to women because it makes them outsiders in the home and community. It also keeps them disconnected from their own blood relatives. In China, where patrilocal and patrilineal customs are common, the written symbols for maternal grandmother, waipa, are separately translated to mean outsider and women. Similarly, in matrilocal residence systems, where it is customary for the husband to live with his wife's blood relatives or her family of orientation, the husband can feel disconnected and can be labeled as an outsider. The Minangkabau people, a matrilocal society that is indigenous to the highlands of West Sumatra in Indonesia, believe that home is the place of women, and they give men little power in issues relating to the home or family. Most societies that use patrilocal and patrilineal systems are patriarchal, but very few societies that use matrilocal and matrilineal systems are matriarchal, as family life is often considered an important part of the culture for women, regardless of their power relative to men. Stages of family life. As we've established, the concept of family has changed greatly in recent decades. Historically, it was often thought that many families evolved through a series of predictable stages. Developmental or stage theories used to play a prominent role in family sociology. Today, however, these models have been criticized for their linear and conventional assumptions, as well as for their failure to capture the diversity of family forms. While reviewing some of these once popular theories, it is important to identify their strengths and weaknesses. The set of predictable steps and patterns families experience over time is referred to as the family life cycle. One of the first designs of the family life cycle was developed by Paul Glick in 1955. In Glick's original design, he asserted that most people will grow up, establish families, rear and launch their children, experience an empty nest period, and come to the end of their lives. This cycle will then continue with each subsequent generation. Glick's colleague, Evelyn Duvall, elaborated on the family life cycle by developing these classic stages of family. Table 14.1. This table shows one example of how a stage theory might categorize the phases a family goes through. The first stage is called a marriage family and is childless. The scon stage is a procreation family and includes children aged zero to two and a half years old. The third stage is a preschooler family with children aged two and a half to six years old. The fourth stage is known as a school age family with children aged 6 to 13. Next is the teenage family, with children aged 13 to 20 years old. The sixth stage is called the launching family. At this stage, children begin to leave home. The seventh and final stage is described as the empty nest family, which means that the adult children have all left home. The family life cycle was used to explain the different processes that occur in families over time. Sociologists view each stage as having its own structure with different challenges, achievements, and accomplishments that transition the family from one stage to the next. For example, the problems and challenges that a family experiences in stage one as a married couple with no children are likely much different than those experienced in stage five as a married couple with teenagers. The success of a family can be measured by how well they adapt to these challenges and transition into each stage. While sociologists use the family life cycle to study the dynamics of family over time, consumer and marketing researchers have used it to determine what goods and services families need as they progress through each stage. As early stage theories have been criticized for generalizing family life and not accounting for differences in gender, ethnicity, culture, and lifestyle, less rigid models of the family life cycle have been developed. One example is the family life course, 
which recognizes the events that occur in the lives of families, but views them as parting terms of a fluid course rather than in consecutive stages. This type of model accounts for changes in family development, such as the fact that in today's society, childbearing does not always occur with marriage. It also sheds light on other shifts in the way family life is practiced. Society's modern understanding of family rejects rigid stage theories and is more accepting of new fluid models. Sociology in the real world. The evolution of television families. Whether you grew up watching the Huxtables, the Simpsons, the Kardashians, or the Johnsons, most of the drama or comedy you saw involved the relationships, tensions, challenges, and sometimes ridiculousness of family life. You may have also seen a great deal of change. The 1960s was the height of the suburban U.S. nuclear family on television, with shows such as The Donna Reed Show and Father Knows Best. While some shows of this era portrayed single parents, My Three Sons and Bonanza, for instance, the single status almost always resulted from being widowed, not divorced or unwed. Although family dynamics in real U.S. homes were changing, the expectations for families portrayed on television were not. The United States' first reality show, An American Family, aired on PBS in 1973. The show chronicled Bill and Pat Loud and their children. During the series, the oldest son, Lance, announced to the family that he was gay, and at the series' conclusion, Bill and Pat decided to divorce. Although the Louds' union was among the 30% of marriages that ended in divorce in 1973, the family was featured on the cover of the March 12 issue of Newsweek with the Titsley, The Broken Family. Less traditional family structures in sitcoms gained popularity in the 1980s with shows such as Different Strokes, A Widowed Man with Two Adopted African-American Sons, and One Day at a Time, A Divorced Woman with Two Teenage Daughters. Still, traditional families such as those in Family Ties and The Cosby Show dominated the ratings. The late 1980s and the 1990s saw the introduction of the dysfunctional family. Shows such as Rossiani, Married with Children, and The Simpsons portray a traditional nuclear families, but in a much less flattering light than those from the 1960s did. In the early 2000s, the non-traditional family has become somewhat of a tradition in television. While many situation comedies focus on single men and women without children, those that do portray families often stray from the classic structure. They include unmarried and divorced parents, adopted children, gay or lesbian couples, and multi-generational households. In 2009, ABC emphasized the changes in family dynamics with their choice of title for Modern Family. The show follows an extended family, which is a household that includes at least one parent and child, as well as other relatives like grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, that consists of a divorced and remarried father with one stepchild and his biological adult children, one of whom is in a traditional two-parent household, and the other who is a gay man in a committed relationship raising an adopted daughter. Black-ish, which portrays an extended family of African Americans, has at many times dealt with the issue implied by its name. That sometimes what it means to be black can bring issues of interpretation conflict, especially across generations. For example, the children of the central family have shown interest in blending in with their white friends, which brings negative reactions from their grandparents. Other shows such as Shameless interweave family diversity with complex and painful issues such as addiction, the series has a large cast of characters representing different groups, and central to the series are the roles of children, rather than parents, as family leaders. The families on shows like this one aren't as idealistic, but they remain relatable, status television critic Maureen Ryan. The most successful shows, comedies especially, have families that you can look at and see parts of your family in them. Fourteen point two variations in family life. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you should be able to recognize variations in family life, explain the prevalence and unique characteristics of single parents, blended families, foster care, cohabitation, same-sex couples, and unmarried individuals. 
Discuss the social impact of changing family structures. The combination of husband, wife, and children that 99.8% of people in the United States believe constitutes a family is not representative of 99.8% of U.S. families. According to 2010 census data, only 66% of children under 17 years old live in a household with two married parents. This is a decrease from 77% in 1980. This two-parent family structure is known as a nuclear family, referring to married parents and children as the nucleus, or core, of the group. Recent years have seen a rise in variations of the nuclear family, with the parents not being married. 3% of children live with two cohabiting parents. Single parents, blended families, and foster families. Single parent households are on the rise. In 2017, 32% of children lived with a single parent only, up from 25% in 2008. Of that 32%, 21% live with their mother, 4% live with their father, which is a percentage that is growing in share. In 1968, for example, only 1% of children lived with a solo father, and 3% lived with a solo father in 2008. About 16% of children are living in blended families, those with step-parents and or step-siblings. This number has remained relatively stable since the 1980s, when the Census Bureau began reliably measuring it. 4% of children live in families with couples who are not married. That number is partially composed of parents in same-sex relationships who were previously prohibited from getting married. In some cases, parents can no longer care for their children. In 2018, 3 million children lived with a guardian who was neither their biological nor adoptive parent. The causes range from parental mental health issues, drug use, or incarceration, as well as physical or sexual abuse of the children by the parent or abandonment by the parent. The wide array of causes leads to a similarly wide array of arrangements and types of people and organizations involved. About half of these children live with grandparents, and about 20% live with other relatives. Sometimes a grandparent or other relative temporarily assumes care of children, perhaps informally, while other times the arrangement is longer term and the state or city child welfare or similar department is involved. 25% of children who do not live with an adoptive or biological parent live with non-relatives, including foster parents, temporary guardians, or people in other types of relationships with the child or the child's parents. Non-relative foster parents are state-certified adults who care for children under the guidance and supervision of a relevant agency. Foster parents comply with guideline and are provided with financial support for the children they care for. Sometimes the term foster parent refers to a relative who cares for the children under agency guidelines, and sometimes these kinship foster parents are also provided financial support. When children are placed into foster care or other non-parental care, agencies and families usually do their best to keep siblings together. Brothers and sisters usually provide each other with someone to navigate social challenges and provide continuity over time. Studies have shown that siblings placed together show more closeness to their foster caregivers and like living in the foster home more than those not placed with a sibling. Separating siblings can cause them to worry about each other or their birth families and slows acceptance of their new home. Siblings sometimes play more of a parental role themselves, especially when there are large age gaps or if there are very young children involved. These older siblings may take on some parental responsibilities during a divorce or when children are sent to live with others. Parentified siblings may have trouble navigating the complexities of parental roles when they themselves are often still very young. These experiences can actually be traumatic and lead to compulsive disorders as well as lifelong issues with relationships and self-care. Changes in the traditional family structure raise questions about how such societal shifts affect children. 
U.S. Census statistics have long shown that children living in homes with both parents grow up with more financial and educational advantages than children who are raised in single-parent homes. Parental marital status seems to be a significant indicator of advancement in a child's life. Children living with a divorced parent typically have more advantages than children living with a parent who never married. This is particularly true of children who live with divorced fathers. This correlates with the statistic that never married parents are typically younger, have fewer years of schooling, and have lower incomes. Six in 10 children living with only their mother live near or below the poverty level. Of those being raised by single mothers, 69% live in or near poverty compared to 45% for divorced mothers, though other factors such as age and education play a role in these differences, it can be inferred that marriage between parents is generally beneficial for children. Cohabitation Living together before or in lieu of marriage is a growing option for many couples. Cohabitation is when a man and woman live together in a sexual relationship without being married. In 2018, 15% of young adults ages 25, 34 live with an unmarried partner, up from 12% 10 years ago. This surge in cohabitation is likely due to the decrease in social stigma pertaining to the practice. 69% of surveyed Americans believe it is acceptable for adults to live together if they are not currently married or do not plan to get married, while 16% say it is acceptable only if they plan to get married. Cohabitating couples may choose to live together in an effort to spend more time together or to save money on living costs. Many couples view cohabitation as a trial run for marriage. 66% of married couples who cohabited but were not engaged saw cohabitation as a step toward marriage. And 44% of cohabiting adults who are not yet engaged or married see moving in with their partner as a step toward marriage. While couples may use this time to work out the kinks of a relationship before they wed, the most recent research has found that cohabitation has little effect on the success of a marriage. In fact, those who do not cohabitate before marriage have slightly better rates of remaining married for more than 10 years. Cohabitation may contribute to the increase in the number of men and women who delay marriage. The median age for marriage is the highest it has ever been since the U.S. Census kept records. Age 26 for women and age 28 for men. Same-sex couples the number of same-sex couples has grown significantly in the past decade. The U.S. Census Bureau reported 594,000 same-sex couple households in the United States, a 50% increase from 2000. This increase is a result of more coupling, the growing social acceptance of LGBTQ people, and a subsequent increase in people's willingness to share more about their identity. Nationally, same-sex couple households make up 1.5% of the total partner-headed households in the United States. When the 2015 Obergefell v. Hodges Supreme Court decision legalized same-sex marriage throughout the United States, all federally mandated spousal rights and benefits began apply to same-sex married couples. These have impacts on Social Security and veterans' benefits, family leave, and so on. For example, when same-sex marriage was not legal, an LGBTQ person couldn't take the same type of family leave as an opposite-sex spouse could if their partner became ill and could even be prohibited from visiting their partner in the hospital. In terms of demographics, same-sex couples are not very different from opposite-sex couples. Same-sex couple households have an average age of 52 and an average annual household income of about $107,000. Opposite-sex couple households have an average age of 59 and an average household income of $97,000. Same-sex couples are less likely to have children under 18 years old, with a rate of 14% compared to 38% of opposite-sex couples. 
Note these include both married and unmarried couples. In an analysis of 81 parenting studies, sociologists found no quantifiable data to support the notion that opposite-sex parenting is any better than same-sex parenting. Children of lesbian couples, however, were shown to have slightly lower rates of behavioral problems and higher rates of self-esteem. Prior to the nationwide legalization, studies also showed that the rate of suicide among high school students declined in states where same-sex marriage was legal. Suicide is the second highest cause of death among high school students, and it is a tragic outcome for LGBTQ teenagers who feel unaccepted or vulnerable. The evidence indicates that the legalization of same-sex marriage had positive outcomes for the emotional and mental well-being of LGBTQ people. E. Staying single About 3 in 10 American adults report that they are single, meaning that they are neither married nor in a committed relationship. That group varies greatly by age and gender. Half of men below age 30 are single, compared with about a quarter of men between ages 30, 64. About 30% of women under 30 are single, and that drops to 19% for women between 30 and 60 years old. There are also differences among racial lines, with white and Hispanic adults less likely to be single than are black people. Single individuals are found in higher concentrations in large cities or metropolitan areas, with New York City being one of the highest. Although both single men and single women report social pressure to get married, women are subject to greater scrutiny. Single women are often portrayed as unhappy or in some way lacking something they should have. Single men, on the other hand, are typically portrayed as lifetime bachelors who cannot settle down or simply have not found the right girl. Single women report feeling insecure and displaced in their families when their single status is disparaged. However, single women older than 35 years old report feeling secure and happy with their unmarried status, as many women in this category have found success in their education and careers. In general, women feel more independent and more prepared to live a large portion of their adult lives without a spouse or domestic partner than they did in the 1960s. The decision to marry or not to marry can be based on a variety of factors, including religion and cultural expectations. Asian individuals are the most likely to marry, while African Americans are the least likely to marry. Additionally, individuals who place no value on religion are more likely to be unmarried than those who place a high value on religion. For black women, however, the importance of religion made no difference in marital status. Bacalar 2010. In general, being single is not a rejection of marriage. Rather, it is a lifestyle that does not necessarily include marriage. Sociological Research Deceptive Divorce Rates it is often cited that half of all marriages end in divorce. This statistic has made many people cynical when it comes to marriage, but it is misleading. Let's take a closer look at the data. Using National Center for Health Statistics data from 2003 that show a marriage rate of 7.5 per 1,000 people and a divorce rate of 3.8, it would appear that exactly one half of all marriages failed. This reasoning is deceptive, however, because instead of tracing actual marriages to see their longevity or lack thereof, this compares what are unrelated statistics. That is, the number of marriages in a given year does not have a direct correlation to the divorces occurring that same year. Research published in the New York Times took a different approach, determining how many people had ever been married, and of those, how many later divorced. The result? According to this analysis, U.S. divorce rates have only gone as high as 41%. Another way to calculate divorce rates would be through a cohort study. For instance, we could determine the percentage of marriages that are intact after, say, five or seven years, compared to marriages that have ended in divorce after five or seven years. 
sociological researchers must remain aware of research methods and how statistical results are applied. As illustrated, different methodologies and different interpretations can lead to contradictory and even misleading results. Theoretical perspectives on marriage and family. Sociologists study families on both the macro and micro level to determine how families function. Sociologists may use a variety of theoretical perspectives to explain events that occur within and outside of the family. Functionalism. When considering the role of family in society, functionalists uphold the notion that families are an important social institution and that they play a key role in stabilizing society. They also note that family members take on status roles in a marriage or family. The family and its members perform certain functions that facilitate the prosperity and development of society. Sociologist George Murdoch conducted a survey of 250 societies and determined that there are four universal residual functions of the family, sexual, reproductive, educational, and economic. According to Murdoch, the family, which for him includes the state of marriage, regulates sexual relations between individuals. He does not deny the existence or impact of premarital or extramarital sex, but states that the family offers a socially legitimate sexual outlet for adults. This outlet gives way to reproduction, which is a necessary part of ensuring the survival of society. Once children are produced, the family plays a vital role in training them for adult life. As the primary agent of socialization and enculturation, the family teaches young children the ways of thinking and behaving that follow social and cultural norms, values, beliefs, and attitudes. Parents teach their children manners and civility. A well-mannered child reflects a well-mannered parent. Parents also teach children gender roles. Gender roles are an important part of the economic function of a family. In each family, there is a division of labor that consists of instrumental and expressive roles. Men tend to assume the instrumental roles in the family, which typically involve work outside of the family that provides financial support and establishes family status. Women tend to assume the expressive roles, which typically involve work inside of the family, which provides emotional support and physical care for children. According to functionalists, the differentiation of the roles on the basis of sex ensures that families are well-balanced and coordinated. When family members move outside of these roles, the family is thrown out of balance and must recalibrate in order to function properly. For example, if the father assumes an expressive role such as providing daytime care for the children, the mother must take on an instrumental role, such as gaining paid employment outside of the home in order for the family to maintain balance and function. Conflict theory. Conflict theorists are quick to point out that U.S. families have been defined as private entities, the consequence of which has been to leave family matters to only those within the family. Many people in the United States are resistant to government intervention in the family. Parents do not want the government to tell them how to raise their children or to become involved in domestic issues. Conflict theory highlights the role of power in family life and contends that the family is often not a haven, but rather an arena where power struggles can occur. This exercise of power often entails the performance of family status roles. Conflict theorists may study conflicts as simple as the enforcement of rules from parent to child, or they may examine more serious issues such as domestic violence, spousal and child, sexual assault, marital rape, and incest. The first study of marital power was performed in 1960. Researchers found that the person with the most access to value resources held the most power. As money is one of the most valuable resources, men who worked in paid labor outside of the home held more power than women who worked inside the home. Conflict theorists find disputes over the division of household labor to be a common source of marital discord. Household labor offers no wages and, therefore, no power. 
studies indicate that when men do more housework, women experience more satisfaction in their marriages, reducing the incidence of conflict. In general, conflict theorists tend to study areas of marriage and life that involve inequalities or discrepancies in power and authority as they are reflective of the larger social structure. Symbolic Interactionism Interactionists view the world in terms of symbols and the meanings assigned to them. The family itself is a symbol. To some, it is a father, mother, and children. To others, it is any union that involves respect and compassion. Interactionists stress that family is not an objective, concrete reality. Like other social phenomena, it is a social construct that is subject to the ebb and flow of social norms and ever-changing meanings. Consider the meaning of other elements of family. Parent was a symbol of a biological and emotional connection to a child. With more parent-child relationships developing through adoption, remarriage, or change in guardianship, the word parent today is less likely to be associated with a biological connection than with whoever is socially recognized as having the responsibility for a child's upbringing. Similarly, the terms mother and father are no longer rigidly associated with the meanings of caregiver and breadwinner. These meanings are more free-flowing through changing family roles. Interactionists also recognize how the family status roles of each member are socially constructed playing an important part in how people perceive and interpret social behavior. Interactionists view the family as a group of role players or actors that come together to act out their parts in an effort to construct a family. These roles are up for interpretation. In the late 19th and early 20th century, a good father, for example, was one who worked hard to provide financial security for his children. Today, a good father is one who takes the time outside of work to promote his children's emotional well-being, social skills, and intellectual growth, in some ways a much more daunting task. Fourteen point three Challenges Families Face Learning Objectives By the end of this section, you should be able to Describe the social and interpersonal impact of divorce. Describe the social and interpersonal impact of family abuse. As the structure of family changes over time, so do the challenges families face. Events like divorce and remarriage present new difficulties for families and individuals. Other long-standing domestic issues, such as abuse, continue to strain the health and stability of today's families, Divorce and Remarriage Divorce, while fairly common and accepted in modern U.S. society, was once a word that would only be whispered and was accompanied by gestures of disapproval. In 1960, divorce was generally uncommon, affecting only 9.1 out of every 1,000 married persons. That number more than doubled to 20.3 by 1975, and peaked in 1980 at 22.6. Over the last quarter century, divorce rates have dropped steadily and are now similar to those in 1970. The dramatic increase in divorce rates after the 1960s has been associated with the liberalization of divorce laws, as well as the shift in societal makeup due to women increasingly entering the workforce. The decrease in divorce rates can be attributed to three probable factors. First, an increase in the age at which people get married, and second, an increased level of education among those who marry, both of which have been found to promote greater marital stability. The third factor is that the marriage rate itself is going down, and with it the divorce rate. In 2019, there were 16.3 new marriages for every 1,000 women age 15, and over in the United States, down from 17.6 in 2009. Divorce does not occur equally among all people in the United States. Some segments of the U.S. population are more likely to divorce than others. According to the American Community Survey, ACS, 
Men and women in the Northeast and Midwest have the lowest rates of divorce. The South generally has the highest rate of divorce. Divorce rates are likely higher in the South because marriage rates are higher and marriage occurs at younger than average ages in this region. In the Northeast, the marriage rate is lower and first marriages tend to be delayed. Therefore, the divorce rate is lower. Note that these are generalizations. For example, the District of Columbia has a high marriage rate, but among the lowest divorce rate. So what causes divorce? While more young people are choosing to postpone or opt out of marriage, those who enter into the union do so with the expectation that it will last. A great deal of marital problems can be related to stress, especially financial stress. According to researchers participating in the University of Virginia's National Marriage Project, couples who enter marriage without a strong asset base, like a home, savings, and a retirement plan, are 70% more likely to be divorced after three years than are couples with at least $10,000 in assets. This is connected to factors such as age and education level that correlate with low incomes. The addition of children to a marriage creates added financial and emotional stress. Research has established that marriages enter their most stressful phase upon the birth of the first child. This is particularly true for couples who have multiples, twins, triplets, and so on. Married couples with twins or triplets are 17% more likely to divorce than those with children from single births. Another contributor to the likelihood of divorce is a general decline in marital satisfaction over time. As people get older, they may find that their values and life goals no longer match up with those of their spouse. Divorce is thought to have a cyclical pattern. Children of divorced parents are 40% more likely to divorce than children of married parents. And when we consider children whose parents divorced and then remarried, the likelihood of their own divorce rises to 91%. This might result from being socialized to a mindset that a broken marriage can be replaced rather than repaired. That sentiment is also reflected in the finding that when both partners of a married couple have been previously divorced, their marriage is 90% more likely to end in divorce. About 15% of all married couples involve one partner who is in their second marriage, while the other partner is in their first marriage. About 9% of married couples are both in their second marriage. The vast majority, 91% of remarriages, occur after divorce. Only 9% occur after death of a spouse. Most men and women remarry within five years of a divorce, with the median length for men, three years being lower than for women, 4.4 years. This length of time has been fairly consistent since the 1950s. The majority of those who remarry are between the ages of 25 and 44. The general pattern of remarriage also shows that white people are more likely to remarry than black people. Marriage the second time around, or third or fourth, can be a very different process than the first. Remarriage lacks many of the classic courtship rituals of a first marriage. In a second marriage, Individuals are less likely to deal with issues like parental approval, premarital sex, or desired family size. In a survey of households formed by remarriage, a mere 8% included only biological children of the remarried couple. Of the 49% of homes that include children, 24% included only the woman's biological children, 3% included only the man's biological children, and 9% included a combination of both spouses' children. Children of Divorce and Remarriage Divorce and remarriage can be stressful on partners and children alike. Divorce is often justified by the notion that children are better off in a divorced family than in a family with parents who do not get along. However, long-term studies determine that to be generally untrue. Research suggests that while marital conflict does not provide an ideal child-rearing environment, going through a divorce can be damaging. Children are often confused and frightened by the threat to their family security. They may feel responsible for the divorce 
and attempt to bring their parents back together, often by sacrificing their own well-being. Only in high-conflict homes do children benefit from divorce and the subsequent decrease in conflict. The majority of divorces come out of lower-conflict homes, and children from those homes are more negatively impacted by the stress of the divorce than the stress of unhappiness in the marriage. Studies also suggest that stress levels for children are not improved when a child acquires a stepfamily through marriage. Although there may be increased economic stability, stepfamilies typically have a high level of interpersonal conflict. Children's ability to deal with a divorce may depend on their age. Research has found that divorce may be most difficult for school-aged children, as they are old enough to understand the separation, but not old enough to understand the reasoning behind it. Older teenagers are more likely to recognize the conflict that led to the divorce, but may still feel fear, loneliness, guilt, and pressure to choose sides. Infants and preschool-age children may suffer the heaviest impact from the loss of routine that the marriage offered. Proximity to parents also makes a difference in a child's well-being after divorce. Boys who live or have joint arrangements with their fathers show less aggression than those who are raised by their mothers only. Similarly, girls who live or have joint arrangements with their mothers tend to be more responsible and mature than those who are raised by their fathers only. Nearly three-fourths of the children of parents who are divorced live in a household headed by their mother leaving many boys without a father figure residing in the home. Still, researchers suggest that a strong parent-child relationship can greatly improve a child's adjustment to divorce. There is empirical evidence that divorce has not discouraged children in terms of how they view marriage and family. A blended family has additional stress resulting from combining children from the current and previous relationships. The blended family may also have a parent that has different discipline techniques. In a survey conducted by researchers from the University of Michigan, about three quarters of high school seniors said it was extremely important to have a strong marriage and family life. And over half believed it was very likely that they would be in a lifelong marriage. These numbers have continued to climb over the last 25 years violence and abuse violence and abuse are among the most disconcerting of the challenges that today's families face abuse can occur between spouses between parent and child as well as between other family members the frequency of violence among families is a difficult to determine because many cases of spousal abuse and child abuse go unreported in any case Studies have shown that abuse, reported or not, has a major impact on families and society as a whole. Domestic violence Domestic violence is a significant social problem in the United States. It is often characterized as violence between household or family members, specifically spouses. To include unmarried, cohabitating, and same-sex couples, Family sociologists have created the term intimate partner violence, IPV. Note that healthcare and support personnel, researchers, or victims may use these terms or related ones interchangeably to refer to the same general issue of violence, aggression, and abuse. Women are the primary victims of intimate partner violence. It is estimated that one in five women has experienced some form of IPV in her lifetime, compared to one in seven men. IPV may include physical violence, such as punching, kicking, or other methods of inflicting physical pain, sexual violence, such as rape or other forced sexual acts, threats and intimidation that imply either physical or sexual abuse, and emotional abuse, such as harming another's sense of self-worth through words or controlling another's behavior. IPV often starts as emotional abuse and then escalates to other forms or combinations of abuse. IPV includes stalking as well as technological violence, sometimes called cyber aggression, which is committed through communications, social networks, or which uses cameras or other technologies to harm victims or control their behavior. 
Beyond its tragic outcomes and damaging long-term effects, sociologists and other researchers seeking to understand and prevent IPV and support victims may find a wide variance in the data. On a global scale, intimate partners kill over 130 women each day. The UN Office of Drugs and Crime reported that women continue to pay the highest price as a result of gender inequality, discrimination, and negative stereotypes. They are also the most likely to be killed by intimate partners and family. The types of violence can vary significantly according to gender. In 2010, of IPV acts that involved physical actions against women, 57% involved physical violence only. 9% involved rape and physical violence. 14% involved physical violence and stalking. 12% involved rape, physical violence and stalking. And 4% involved rape only. This is vastly different than IPV abuse patterns for men, which show that nearly all 92% physical acts of IVP take the form of physical violence and fewer than 1% involve rape alone or in combination. Perpetrators of IPV work to establish and maintain dependence in order to hold power and control over their victims, making them feel stupid, crazy, or ugly, in some way, worthless. IPV affects different segments of the population at different rates. The rate of IPV for Native American and Alaskan Native women is higher than any other race. The rate of IPV for black women, 4.6 per 1,000 persons over the age of 12, is higher than that for white women, 3.1. These numbers have been fairly stable for both racial groups over the last 10 years. Accurate statistics on IPV are difficult to determine, as it is estimated that more than half of non-fatal IPV goes unreported. It is not until victims choose to report crimes that patterns of abuse are exposed. Most victims studied stated that abuse had occurred for at least two years prior to their first report. Also, studies and research methods apply a range of categories, which makes comparative or reinforcing data difficult to obtain. For example, some studies may only ask about IPV in two categories, for example, physical and sexual violence only, and may find fewer respondents reporting IPV than do studies that add psychological abuse, stalking, and technological violence. Sometimes abuse is reported to police by a third party, but it still may not be confirmed by victims. A study of domestic violence incident reports found that even when confronted by police about abuse, 29% of victims denied that abuse occurred. Surprisingly, 19% of their assailants were likely to admit to abuse. According to the National Criminal Victims Survey, victims cite varied reasons why they are reluctant to report abuse, as shown in the following table. Table 14.2. Reasons victims give for why they fail to report abuse to police authorities. One reason abuse goes unreported is because it is considered to be a private matter. 22% of females and 39% of males gave this reason. Another reason why abuse goes unreported is due to the fear of retaliation. Here, 12% of females and 5% of males gave this reason. Next, 14% of females and 16% of men failed to report abuse as a way of protecting their abuser. Lastly, 8% of both females and males failed to report abuse because they believed that the police would not do anything about it. IPV against LGBTQ people is generally higher than it is against non-LGBTQ people. Gay men report experiencing IPV in their lifetimes less often, 26%, than straight men, 29%, or bisexual men, 37%. 44% of lesbian women report experiencing some type of IPV in their lifetime compared to 35% of straight women. 61% of bisexual women report experiencing IPV, a much higher rate than any other sexual orientation frequently studied. Studies regarding intimate partner violence against transgender people are relatively limited, but several are ongoing. 
a meta-analysis of available information indicated that physical IPV had occurred in the lifetimes of 38% of transgender people and 25% of transgender people had experienced sexual IPV in their lifetimes. Compared with cisgender individuals, transgender individuals were 1.7 times more likely to experience any IPV. Many college students encounter IPV as well. Overall, psychological violence seems to be the type of IPV college students face most frequently, followed by physical and or sexual violence. Of high schoolers who report being in a dating relationship, 10% experience physical violence by a boyfriend or girlfriend, 7% experience forced sexual intercourse, and 11% experience sexual dating violence. 7% of women and 4% of men who experience IPV are victimized before age 18. IPV victimization during young adulthood, including the college years, is likely to lead to continuous victimization in adulthood, possibly throughout a lifetime. Child abuse. Children are among the most helpless victims of abuse. In 2010, there were more than 3.3 million reports of child abuse involving an estimated 5.9 million children. Three-fifths of child abuse reports are made by professionals, including teachers, law enforcement personnel, and social services staff. The rest are made by anonymous sources, other relatives, parents, friends, and neighbors. Child abuse may come in several forms, the most common being neglect, 78.3%, followed by physical abuse, 10.8%, sexual abuse, 7.6%, psychological maltreatment, 7.6%, and medical neglect, 2.4%. Some children suffer from a combination of these forms of abuse. The majority, 81.2% of perpetrators are parents, 6.2% are other relatives. Infants, children less than one year old, were the most victimized population with an incident rate of 20.6 per 1,000 infants. This age group is particularly vulnerable to neglect because they are entirely dependent on parents for care. Some parents do not purposely neglect their children. Factors such as cultural values, standard of care in a community, and poverty can lead to hazardous level of neglect. If information or assistance from public or private services are available and a parent fails to use those services, child welfare services may intervene. Infants are also often victims of physical abuse, particularly in the form of violent shaking. This type of physical abuse is referred to as shaken baby syndrome, which describes a group of medical symptoms such as brain swelling and retinal hemorrhage resulting from forcefully shaking or causing impact to an infant's head. A baby's cry is the number one trigger for shaking. Parents may find themselves unable to soothe the baby's concerns and may take their frustration out on the child by shaking him or her violently. Other stress factors, such as a poor economy, unemployment, and general dissatisfaction with parental life, may contribute this type of abuse. While there is no official central registry of shaken baby syndrome statistics, it is estimated that each year 1,400 babies die or suffer serious injury from being shaken. Child abuse occurs at all socioeconomic and education levels and crosses ethnic and cultural lines. Just as child abuse is often associated with stresses felt by parents, including financial stress, parents who demonstrate resilience to these stresses are less likely to abuse. Young parents are typically less capable of coping with stresses, particularly the stress of becoming a new parent. Teenage mothers are more likely to abuse their children than their older counterparts. As a parent's age increases, the risk of abuse decreases. Children born to mothers who are 15 years old or younger are twice as likely to be abused or neglected by age 5 than are children born to mothers ages 20 to 21. Drug and alcohol use is also a known contributor to child abuse. Children raised by substance abusers 
have a risk of physical abuse three times greater than other kids, and neglect is four times as prevalent in these families. Other risk factors include social isolation, depression, low parental education, and a history of being mistreated as a child. Approximately 30% of abused children will later abuse their own children. The long-term effects of child abuse impact the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of a child. Injury, poor health, and mental instability occur at a high rate in this group, with 80% meeting the criteria of one or more psychiatric disorders, such as depression, anxiety, or suicidal behavior, by age 21. Abused children may also suffer from cognitive and social difficulties. Behavioral consequences will affect most, but not all, of child abuse victims. Children of abuse are 25% more likely, as adolescents, to suffer from difficulties like poor academic performance and teen pregnancy, or to engage in behaviors like drug abuse and general delinquency. They are also more likely to participate in risky sexual acts that increase their chances of contracting a sexually transmitted disease. Other risky behaviors include drug and alcohol abuse. As these consequences can affect the healthcare, education, and criminal systems, the problems resulting from child abuse do not just belong to the child and family, but to society as a whole. Social Policy and Debate Corporal Punishment Physical abuse in children may come in the form of beating, kicking, throwing, choking, hitting with objects, burning, or other methods. Injury inflicted by such behavior is considered abuse even if the parent or caregiver did not intend to harm the child. Other types of physical contact that are characterized as discipline, spanking, for example, are not considered abuse as long as no injury results. This issue is rather controversial among modern-day people in the United States. While some parents feel that physical discipline or corporal punishment is an effective way to respond to bad behavior, others feel that it is a form of abuse. According to a poll conducted by ABC News, 65% of respondents approve of spanking and 50% said that they sometimes spank their child. Tendency toward physical punishment may be affected by culture and education. Those who live in the South are more likely than those who live in other regions to spank their child. Those who do not have a college education are also more likely to spank their child. Currently, 23 states officially allow spanking in the school system. However, many parents may object, and school officials must follow a set of clear guidelines when administering this type of punishment. Studies have shown that spanking is not an effective form of punishment and may lead to aggression by the victim particularly in those who are spanked at a young age. This has been Introduction to Sociology, 3rd Edition, from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by the Los Angeles Harbor College Foundation. Los Angeles Harbor College is a public community college and your gateway to an affordable and outstanding college education. You can register for in-person and online courses today by visiting www.lahc.edu. Whether you are just starting your college journey, nearing graduation, or planning to transfer to a university, LAHC can help you achieve your educational goals. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can also download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses. Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.